Well, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to this important session. Two years after the Talbral earthquake in Haiti, Haiti's in the process of turning the corner. But there's a great danger that the world will be turning the page. Because with a crisis in the Eurozone, with the other challenges, it's so easy for people to forget both the challenges but also the great opportunities in Haiti. And to ensure that that does not occur, we are having this session here today. And President Martelli, we're so pleased that you can be with us here today. Mr. President, a few days after the, the terrible earthquake, we were holding our January Davos in 2010. And in a conversation between uh, Klaus Schwab and President Clinton, and also with Luis Moreno, the decision was made to actually put uh, Haiti up front in the conversation then. And so we had a number of public and private sessions in 2010 where we said, we need to do what we can now, but we should even more importantly commit ourselves to doing more going forward because we realized it was going to be a long-term issue. Over the last two years, we've tried to keep that commitment. So last year, uh, we had sessions on building back better, uh, both in the public and private sessions here. We also produced a number of different analyses looking at the opportunities for private sector driven, but partnership um, implemented growth in, in Haiti. And now today, we're extraordinarily pleased to have you here with us because at a time when the world might be turning its back on Haiti, you're here to give a voice and a face to the new Haiti, the new possibilities. So Mr. President, on behalf of everyone here at the World Economic Forum, welcome to Davos. Thank you, Robert, and thank you for the support that you have brought to Haiti since the earthquake, particularly. And thank you, everyone, for, the interest, for your interest for Haiti. I came here mainly to tell you that the old Haiti that you've been hearing about, the, image, the images that you've been seeing, this, is, this Haiti is all over now. I have nothing to do with politics before I, I had nothing to do with politics before I got elected. I was a musician, but because I was always involved in trying to change the lives of my brothers and sisters, the Haitian people, I became someone that they trusted. They felt like my heart was always in Haiti, that my love for Haiti was sincere, my commitment was sincere. So it became easy for me to win these elections. And since then, I'm happy to say that things have started moving. When I came to power, I felt like Haiti still looked like the earthquake had happened the day before. But since then, we've been able to bring 903,000 kids to school freely. We've been able to provide free transportation to them. We have started building 4,000 homes in an area outside of Haiti. We have, I have appointed for the first time since seven years the Supreme Court judge. I have started, I have launched a program called Abagangu to fight hunger where mothers, about a million, will be getting money through fund transfers. And uh, in order for them to be eligible, they must send their kids to school and the kids must be vaccinated. We have held with the help of the IDB in Haiti an economic forum where about a thousand, a thousand for investors came to Haiti. And from that, we were able to get some very important deals. One of them, the Marriott deal, about a deal worth about 150 million. Again, it's small compared to what Haiti needs today. But it's very important. It's a strong signal compared to what was never done before I came in. So I'm here to reassure the world, tell you that this is a new Haiti. I'm here. I'm in power to take decisions to change the lives of the Haitian. We are fortunate to have some partners who, are, who believe in us. I can mention the IDB. I can mention uh, Nestle, who's doing some work down in Haiti. I can mention Marriott. Dennis, who's doing some great work in Haiti. 
and all of these companies who have dared uh, today happy that they, they did. We are, I'm, I'm ready to stand by any, anyone who comes to Haiti to invest, to protect their investment, allow them to enjoy the, the advantages, fiscal advantages, the, the laws and the treaties that Haiti uh, has, for instance, the, the HOPE law, the HELP law, who allows you to, to export uh, freely from Haiti to the United States of America personally. We are very encouraged with what's happening. We are actually building the, what's going to be the biggest industrial park in Haiti, in the north of Haiti, where uh, we hope to employ directly and indirectly about 80,000 people. SEA, a Korean company, is investing $60 million. So these are great news. I'm here to tell you that you're welcome to come to Haiti, visit, and uh, find out that this new leadership is about no more aid but trade, no more handouts but hands up. We are working toward diminishing the getting aid from countries. We want to bring investors, investment to Haiti so we can create jobs and therefore have sustainable development. This is actually my message. And with this, I will return to... Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And one of the elements that was very important that you underlined was uh, the democratic processes that have taken place over the last year that resulted in, in your being elected, not because you were the choice of the establishment, but because you were the choice of the people of Haiti and with all the credibility and energy that that provides. At the same time, it's, it's clear that the last two years have been challenging. And for those who were involved in every level, including Haitians themselves, there was a sense it didn't go as fast as people wanted. What's your sense of that? Why? Why did it take so long? And, and what do you think the situation is likely to be going forward? Well, for not having been a politician, I believe that uh, the, the politicians were not too too happy with my victory. It was a huge victory, about 68% of the population. They wanted that change that I had promised. And uh, when I came to power, it was hard for me to even get my prime, uh, prime minister ratified. I had to wait about seven months. But while I was waiting, I didn't stop working. Indeed, I did start uh, marking points. For instance, I came in in May, and the next school year, which, which started in October, I had already 903,000 kids in school. You know, wherever there's democracy, you have, to, you have to deal with it. And we intend to, to follow the process, except that uh, people are becoming more and more confident as they are identifying uh, success and great stories of success. So uh, every day, things are getting better. The confidence remains high as far as the population is concerned, as they have identified that uh, we, are, we are moving in the right direction. So things are getting better. Yeah. Well, and, and Mr. President, you mentioned the point about things getting better. One of the things that people may not realize is uh, Haiti's growth last year was 8.6%. In fact, the IMF January projections that came out, which actually downgraded the world, upgraded Haiti's growth prospects to almost 9% for this year. So there is a sense of possibility. But let me go forward from the situation now to the situation by the end, end of your term. What would you like to be the situation in Haiti by the end of this, of this term? Well, for instance, the, the, this park that, that's being built in the north, we expect to duplicate, have many of them uh, a little bit everywhere in Haiti, so we can actually create jobs. Uh, Marriott that's coming is a great news. We also have uh, the Best Western coming down. Yeah. We're, um, we are building roads here and there with the help of the IDB. We have uh, inaugurated the national number one uh, about a few months ago. We are actually working on the south side of the country. Uh, as far as the energy sector, 
we are today at 25 percent of what needed in Haiti and in Haiti we complain about not having electricity but I, I see this as an opportunity for big companies who are interested in that sector to come down to Haiti and I do expect that by the end of my term that every kid will be in school freely that uh, we'll be able to have uh, many roads built, many hotels, many jobs created and if I succeed at doing this, we will have moved forward. And certainly uh, the rule of law, working at making sure that uh, the rule of law prevails, and I have appointed a commission for a judiciary reform, as corruption is something that we need, we must eradicate, we must. That's an that's a ambitious agenda. And you mentioned partnerships to do that, and you referred to, to the international, to the Inter-American Development Bank. And Ruth Moreno, you've been involved in, in Haiti passionately and personally in, in your role as, as the head of the Inter-American Development Bank for many years, um, and particularly since, since the earthquake. What's your prognosis of the situation now? Well, look, uh, first of all, I, I think you all can judge the, from the kind of energy that President Martelly has what this means on the ground. When one thinks of Haiti and the kinds of stresses it's been through, it's something almost impossible to imagine because what that earthquake meant to Haiti and some of the natural disasters that preceded it were really, really uh, huge. And no matter what country in the world, if it went through that, it would have a very long period of recovery. What we see today is truly a new day, a new day where some of the things, the commitments that the international community made are starting to, to, to come together. Uh, but more importantly, the fact that you have a president elected democratically, that he's been able to appoint, appoint an extremely strong team, very good prime minister. I mean, these were things that before did not happen in Haiti. But more importantly, with a very clear focus around a number of areas. One is education, which I give a lot of credit to the president for focusing on that, because I believe that this is really the game changer. Here's a country with almost 1.3 million kids that do not go to school in a population of 9 million. I mean, what country can endure that over time? And, and, and it, we're talking that the average age in Haiti is probably 24. So, you know, this is a hugely important issue. And uh, the president really take, took that on, and I think everybody in the international community is going to follow him in a process where no longer does a family have to pay $100 per kid per year, but it will be a system that is tuition free, that you can basically work on uh, lifting the quality of education. That's the kind of environment that you can really put in place a new education system that you perhaps could not in any other place because the complexities, unions, and the rest of it. The other part is, of course, the infrastructure. I mean, Haiti for many, many years, more than reconstructing, is about constructing. I mean, there were so many roads that were never uh, built, and we and others, uh, European Union, Canada, and many other donors, uh, U.S., have participated in helping build some of the key roads that Haiti needs, build the power structure, uh, the, the needs in power, the needs in water and sanitation, all of which we have been uh, working on. And of course, the agricultural sector. I mean, Haiti is a country that largely impo imports most of its food. If we know anything today is that we're in an environment that for the next 10 or 15 years, the world's going to see rising commodity prices because of larger demand uh, in other parts of the world. And I think that's something that needs to be uh, taken the best opportunity of and begin to help develop especially the central plateau that it has a huge potential. The productivity levels, they are very low, but that's something we're working on. And as we know, you know, getting the kind of agricultural production requires uh, the whole system of irrigation to be in place, logistics, etc. But some of that we're working, I'm sure that Bruce will tell you some of the examples that are being developed there. And finally, the development of the private sector. And here I think uh, what President Martelly and his focus on giving an opportunity to the private sector and embracing the private sector coming to Haiti is very important. I want to say that there is no country in the world 
that has a better trade agreement with the United States than Haiti. And for that matter, what the minister here did recently is begin to enlarge that trade agreement to other countries in the world. So what you have is a platform that is literally an hour, 15 minutes from the United States, centrally located with extremely good labor force. Because the one thing that few people talk about, which I think is the biggest resource Haiti has, is its people. Talk to anybody, and I'm sure uh, our friends from Mary will tell you. They will tell you the kind of quality workers the Haitians are in their hotels throughout the United States. Or Dennis can tell you the same. And this, I believe, is the combination of a real opportunity that the first mover advantage, companies like Dennis, companies like, uh, uh, and what he's done uh, with Digicel, what Marriott is doing, they, will, they know that in the long run, the fact that they move now yeah. is going to make a difference. And I would, uh, talking about uh, Digicel, Dennis O'Brien, you're the, the largest private sector in, in investor in Haiti, but you're also perhaps more important, the most gauged. I mean, you, you've seen it through the challenges that, that uh, uh, Lisa Moreno, Moreno was talking about with, with the hurricanes and the earthquake, but you've actually kept at it. And in fact, the results are quite different than people would expect if they just read the headlines. What's, what's your prognosis right now in the situation? Well, you know, you know, it was shocking, the earthquake, but it was an inflection point for Haiti because, you know, people had views of what Haiti was like as a place to invest, and they didn't invest. And now we see democracy working really well, and we have the disappearance of the old Haiti. And under this new presidency of President Martelli, we're seeing a kind of a night and day experience because as a foreign direct investor, you know, you're conscious of what the political situation is, and now we have a stable situation. The state more and more is taking back over the governance of the country away from NGOs, and, you know, there is a lot of capacity building. And in that kind of environment, it gives you great confidence. So, you know, up until a year ago, we'd invested about $450 million, and in the last six months, because of this new stability, we're investing another $150 million in laying fiber 4G networks. And I, I, I would say to all foreign direct investors, you know, Haiti is one of those places where it's about to explode over the next number of years. We're seeing last year it grew by 9%. We think next year is going to, this current year is going to be another maybe, could be 10%. So it's a high growth economy. It's a very cash-based economy. It's a consumer economy as well. And I think, you know, for international brands, we've seen in the last month or so, Heineken come in and make a huge investment in the country. And I think more and more major players are going to be looking at Haiti and coming to invest. And I think the opportunities in infrastructure building airports, uh, in ports, road building, reconstruction, um, in tourism, I mean, the, the, the opportunity for tourism is absolutely vast. If you fly over the northern coast of Haiti, you'd nearly fall out of your seat how beautiful it is. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. But I think as a place to do business, Haiti is really, really a very, very solid place to be. We operate in 30 countries, but we are so enthusiastic about Haiti, we are out telling foreign direct investors come because, you know, the opportunities are immense. And the other fundamental thing is our staff. You know, the engagement from staff, the quality of the management as well of our Haitian managers is second to none. So you have a very intelligent workforce, hardworking workforce, and they just all the time want to improve their own situation, but their family situation. And the, the family unit is so powerful in Haiti uh, that it's, it's, it's just incredible. So I'm, I'm, very impo I'm very positive. My board is very positive. And I think, you know, what we've seen in the last four or five months, the quicker decision making is, I think, a great credit. And I think the support of the World Economic Forum, IDB, President Clinton has been an incredible advocate, and so has Klaus. 
so, I, I, you know, it really has a lot of very support. So I think the reception the president is getting here this week is really, really powerful in a movement of change. And Dennis, it, it's interesting with your experience because there's no doubt there's a challenge. The government institutions are just being built or rebuilt. Yeah. There's um, getting to know and understand mm -hmm. how to work effectively in Haiti. What's your advice to companies or organizations who are looking to engage with Haiti? I mean, how does one do that effectively? Very, very easily. I mean, obviously, um, the president is here. He's with his staff as well. So, you know, if there are people out there to the World Economic Forum, of course, you know, please make contact. I would be delighted, obviously, to, I'm sure, Lewis would as well, just to talk to the foreign direct investors and give them our experience. And yeah, there are little wrinkles along the way, you know, things you have to overcome, but that's the same if you were to invest in any country in Europe. So um, there, there, you know, for people out there, this has been televised, uh, just make contact with the World Economic Forum. And Arne Sorensen, you're talking about an investors. You, you've actually just made, Marriott's just made a, a significant investment in, in Haiti. Maybe you could share with us your thinking behind that, but also what, what do you hope to accomplish with that? Well, first, first let me say it's an honor to be on the stage with a group of leaders that is doing so much for Haiti. Um, I'm humbled to be in your presence and uh, really inspired by what you have done on the ground there. Uh, President, President Martelli, welcome to the new leadership role that you're taking and uh, we've watched what Dennis and Digicel has done and it's extra extraordinary the progress that has been made. What we've done is very small by comparison in many respects, but when the earthquake hit, uh, we heard from our Haitian associates, and we have a few thousand Haitian associates in the United States, mostly in Florida and New York, uh, that they wanted us to be involved with them somehow in Haiti. And we initially made a donation, but they, they wanted something more, and ultimately they came up with the idea of, why don't we find a way to get a hotel in Port-au-Prince? Uh, and so we, we reached out to President Clinton and uh, to Dennis through Digicel uh, and started our conversations about uh, that market uh, and came to love the potential that is there. Uh, there's an obvious and immediate need for uh, hotel rooms to welcome the people who are traveling to Haiti uh, today. Uh, and so there's a real business need for this hotel to be uh, built and constructed. Uh, and uh, we're really inspired by the fact that there will be 175 uh, Haitians working in that hotel uh, when it opens, uh, and uh, we'll work with them to train them and do the things that are needed in order to make sure that we're taking care of our guests and, and doing the things that need to accomplish. The work that we did, again, with these partnerships, which is so important, uh, really told us that it was time to put a sign up uh, that Haiti is open for business, welcome to Haiti. Uh, and we hope that by putting the Marriott brand uh, boldly on a building in Port-au-Prince, uh, that we communicate to folks, not only can you get a good night's sleep when you come and we'll take care of you in that very concrete way, uh, but you should come to Haiti. Uh, it's safe to come to Haiti, there are things happening in Haiti, there's business being done here, and there's also an enormous tourism potential. Uh, we start with one hotel. Uh, but hopefully it doesn't end there because, uh, as has been mentioned, when you fly over this country and you see the potential, uh, and uh, as compelling as President Martelli's smile is, uh, we see it on thousands of Haitian associates in our hotels all the time. This is a people that is uh, extraordinary at welcoming and uh, giving pleasure in life, and we hope to be part of that uh, in the great place of Haiti. You know, and one of the very interesting things of the last couple of years has actually been the very creative ways in which different organizations internationally have been engaged. I mean, the uh, President Clinton, the Clinton Global Initiative have played a really important role in terms of gathering together different stakeholders. Dennis, you've played a leadership role with President Clinton on, on that element. Uh, but we've also seen a number of corporations step up. Uh, Coca-Cola and Mutar Kent, after a conversation, Luis, I think with you here in Davos two years ago, uh, launched forward with, with a very bold concept. Uh, Nestle's been involved recently in announcing engaging in coffee growing in Colombia, in, in, in Haiti with the Coffee Growers Association of Colombia, a very interesting uh, model. Um, in, in the earthquake and immediately afterwards, Google, uh, McKinsey and Company, PwC, Accenture, a number of other organizations here 
uh, have been very engaged. Mercy Corps is now working with one of Europe's largest insurance companies to set up a for-profit social entrepreneurship uh, microinsurance scheme in Haiti. So the interesting element has been not just who's been involved, but how they've been involved and these new partnerships working between government, civil society, and the private sector. So it's not one or the other, but it's the two or three working together. And in fact, uh, I think one of the best examples of that is, Bruce, the work you've been doing with Coke, uh, with Mutar Kent, with, with Technoser's leadership and capability, taking the inspiration that came out of the conversation in Davos and actually making it reality on the ground. So maybe you could share with us, Bruce, some of your perspectives in terms of that journey. Sure. Well, thanks, Bob. And, and as you said, this was an idea that came out of a conversation that Luis had with Mutar Kent here two years ago in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake. But thinking even then beyond reconstruction to rebuilding for the longer term. Coke has been on the ground in Haiti as the largest employer for many, many years. But as they started to think about challenged by this conversation, what could they be doing more broadly? Building on some work we'd done with them in East Africa, they thought, we are actually at this point in the United States selling a lot of fruit juices, sourcing fruit, among them mango, uh, from Mexico and other parts of uh, Latin America, when in fact Haiti grows some of the best mangoes in the world. And in fact, the Francique mango is unique to Haiti and it's one of the best flavor profiles uh, there are. And so with that in mind, Coke very aggressively moved to partner with us, with IDB, with USAID and other partners, and in seven weeks, launched the Haiti Hope Initiative to actually build their supply chain backwards into Haiti and to work at that point about 25,000 mango farmers. So in March of 2010, the Adwala brand, which is a Coke brand, launched Haiti Hope. Mango Tango is their second largest selling fruit juice. The di a dime from the sale of every one of these goes back into their investment in Haiti. And that money is being used to organize farmers to engage commercially. Uh, and to give them an opportunity to increase their own income by virtue of their work and their link into a viable commercial market. So our efforts are to organize farmers around agronomy, but more importantly into co-ops and farmer-owned business groups that can commercially interact with markets to help them get access to credit, which has not been available in any, in any large-scale way for farmers, particularly smallholder farmers, working there with Soja Sol with backing from the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund, to work with intermediaries in that value chain, because that's what you have to, that's what Coke can't do. It's can they get in and work with the providers of logistics and transportation and storage service, to work with the exporters on actually getting the quality product in the fresh market into the United States, and then to begin thinking even now about the investment possibilities around processing for purees on the ground in Haiti. And I think it's that kind of enlightened approach on the part of Coca-Cola thinking about how do we think about creating shared value? How do I think about doing what I do as Coca-Cola in a business sense, but also widening that to think about actually how can I actually accomplish a broader social purpose? In this case, it's doing what President Martelli has referred to. It's no longer about handouts. How do we give people a real hand up? And there are ample opportunities to do that in agriculture, but in small business development too. But in agriculture, you refer to cocoa, coffee, cocoa, essential oils, limes, vertiver, uh, vertebra oils, uh, rice as an import substitution play. There are real commercial possibilities for indigenous Haitian entrepreneurs if given the right sets of relationships, training, and access to capital. Mr. Martelli, when, when you listen to this, I mean, about the actual growth rate of, of over, I mean, the actual realized growth rate of 8% last year, 9% according to the IMF, maybe as high as 10 according to, to, to Dennis for next year. I mean, that's pretty exciting. But at the same time, it's also pretty challenging. What do you see as the biggest challenges that we need to collectively overcome in the next year or two to kind of realize some of these opportunities? Well, Robert, going in that direction, I feel like uh, we will overcome. I feel like everyone in this panel is a partner. They are engaged in helping me change Haiti. We have started. Things are happening. So I believe that we, we will have some challenges, but we will be, they will be overcome. We will, we will move forward on every aspect. Today, clean water remains a problem, but we have uh, enterprises that are down to Haiti, down in Haiti, working at making clean water available everywhere. I just mentioned the energy problem, which is a real problem. 
but again, it's big opportunities for some companies, and they are coming down. We haven't mentioned today Heineken, who just brought a brewer in, a brewer in Haiti, yeah. and uh, with this, they are also thinking of producing uh, rice and, and other crops that can be used to actually make the beer. So the real challenge was to create jobs in Haiti, create jobs, create jobs. And with the kind of partner that we have on this panel and who are also uh, serving as ambassador, they didn't just invest in Haiti. They come here to the World Economic Forum and they promote Haiti. They talk about their investment and the success that they're having down there. I think uh, we're not afraid of the future. Let's open it up and, and get some questions and comments, because we wanted to take the conversation from this group here, but also more broadly. And let me uh, turn Scott Gilmore, you've, you've been involved with, with Peace Dividend Trust in sort of social entrepreneurship models around the world, including challenging places like Afghanistan and elsewhere. What's your take on the Haiti situation? And what's your also any advice you would provide to the president? Well, uh, President Martelli, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to see you here today. Um, I'm actually delighted to see such a strong private sector presence here on this panel. Uh, we recently did a survey of the construction industry in Haiti and found that uh, before the, uh, the earthquake, only 25% of the large-scale construction that was taking place in Haiti was being done by Haitian companies. That's up to 45% today, but it's still significantly lower than what it could be. Haitian construction companies are capable of, of uh, doing great things, and it's always a little bit heartbreaking when I see foreign construction companies building hotels and, and, and that. And frankly, it's, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use the hotels as an example because the international, or the international private sector is so much better at this than the United Nations is or the aid agencies. And so actually the question I have for the panel is, why is it, Mr. Sorensen, that um, you can use local contractors to meet your, your profit objectives and get things done? And yet, Mr. Martelli, we see again and again and again, the United Nations has to fly people in to do the same thing. Thank you. Oh, well, you this is Please go ahead. This is something that uh, we we talking to our partners about partnering with Haitian companies, subcontracting them, and it's happening. It's it's actually happening. You have to understand that today Haiti is a land of opportunities. So business businesses come to Haiti uh, looking for contracts. And through the IHRC, who was the commission in charge of reconst the reconstruction of Haiti, they have gotten a contract. So uh, the main thing is to make sure that Haitian companies get some part of the jobs. But uh, we will not uh, keep anyone out, as we want to keep on attracting uh, businesses in Haiti. Can I just chime in here? <clears throat> I mean, I am and there are some very good Haitian contracting companies. We use about 12 of them. Um, and, you know, I think there's an awful lot of capacity there and capability. So I think that is changing. And um, I think we should also welcome in international companies as well because they also do a technical transfer. So I think it's a com combination of both. Uh, but I don't think anybody can say, well, we're not going to use international firms or we're only going to use Haitian firms. I think it's a competitive market. Uh, and we're seeing Kier, for example, KIER, which is a UK company, come in. Um, they're a highly capable organization, but there's also highly capable Haitian contractors. So, and the quality is good, and um, the efficiency is good, and standards are being raised. So I, I think uh, you know, there, there isn't a necessity to bring in a whole pile of international people. There are plenty there already. I'll just say that uh, the way we work, and I think it's very important from a development perspective to help in all the institutional building of the Haitian government, and that's what we have been very committed. But it's also important to think a bit uh, in the line that Dennis was saying, in having different kinds of models, for instance, in the water system of Puerto Prince, we brought in a Spanish company that's very successful in administering these uh, water systems throughout the world. But they're doing it with Haitian staff. And I think we, it's, it's not a, uh, you know, one is better than the other, but it's, it's just solution driven and, and in the capacity building of the country as a whole. I think this is really the one area 
uh, that we all have to invest over time if you are in the development field as we are, and that's what uh, we have been doing. And frankly speaking, uh, if you start to look at not only what President Martelly would tell you, but around his government, you're starting to see that, uh, you know, death of, of, uh, of talent that began uh, to be there. And uh, there's things, for instance, uh, that we have been working in these doing business indicators. President Martelly is uh, working on, on something that we did, for instance, for, uh, for allowing uh, uh, quick decisions on construction licenses or for starting a business, which I guarantee you will move up the dial in whatever uh, any, uh, the World Bank or anybody looking at doing business indicators in Haiti will show that Haiti will begin to move up uh, in this area as well. Also, the last uh, earthquake that we had uh, we we'll have to go back to about 150 years. So we don't, we'd never had that culture of building uh, with anti-seismic. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we, we, need, we, need, we need these companies to come down now and show us how to do it. As Dennis was saying, transfer of technology. So it's very important for them to be on the ground also on that aspect. Very interesting. Let me open up other questions, other comments from different, different uh, perspectives. Please, sir. But if you could uh, introduce yourself. Uh, George Foster from Stanford University. Um, sometimes when you have uh, situations like you have in Haiti now, it sort of kickstarts the entrepreneurial community. I was just wondering, are you seeing some of that going on in Haiti? Um, can I answer that? Please, Dan. Um, we, we, in the last couple of years, have run the Entrepreneur of the Year Awards in, in, uh, in Haiti. And we've done this on a regional basis, and we've done it for people who have small, tiny micro businesses, medium sized businesses, and large scale businesses. And, you know, the response has been we run a television program over many, many weeks, and then there's a grand final. And just before Christmas, President uh, Martelli gave, an, uh, gave the award to all these different category winners, and then a, the, fi uh, the overall winner. And it has been, you know, the highest rating TV program in Haiti. So uh, it is, it, there is, uh, there are, the, uh, you know, there are nine million entrepreneurs in here. I used to think Ireland was entrepreneurial until I went to Haiti. Uh, everybody is entrepreneurial in Haiti because they're used to making a living. You know, they come from a farming background, so many people, and they're buying and selling things. And, you know, there are people who are getting together co-ops in the mango business, but also in the sewing pads, the pods as well, uh, uh, coffee co-ops. There's so many groups coming together as entrepreneurs and collaborating that it's, it's really very, at the grassroots level, it's incredibly vibrant. And if you travel around the country with very limited capital, people have done extraordinary things. And I think it's a mixture of you know, getting investment, obviously the larger scale investments, but also through funds that IDB uh, have been making available to these kind of micro uh, investment uh, funds is the way, you know, to build up the economy. So it's not like other countries where, you know, entrepreneurialism, you have to nearly drag it out of people. Everybody is an entrepreneur nearly. Maybe I can just build on that because it was interesting. One of the other elements that came out of the conversations in Davos two years ago was a, a partnership between SAP and, and Grameen out of Bangladesh to set up a social entrepreneurship fund um, called YY Haiti because there was a sense that there is this, this element of, of entrepreneurship, but it's how does one channel and inform that entrepreneurial spirit to be able to compete effectively in 21st century business models? And so that's one element. So can we actually take experience and expertise from the private sector or other parts of the world to help actually empower that Haitian entrepreneurial spirit? And then um, the Canadian government uh, under CETA has actually been involved, I believe, Mr. President, in a number of technical schools to actually help create the education for employment. So as these businesses are developed, they actually have the technical skills behind them. Perhaps, Mr. President, you could comment a little bit on this. How does one equip the Haitian people with the education that's necessary for the jobs of today and the future? Before, before I answer to that, Please. I want to ask also that uh, Spain gave us a fund of $50 million that has been given to the IDB so we can 
through our institutions, uh, lend money to the young entrepreneurs. And I'm positive that uh, pretty soon we're going to feel, we're going to start feeling the, the, the impact of these young entrepreneurs. As Dennis has stated, uh, probably from living such a difficult life, every Haitian has become an entrepreneur. They had to create means to survive. Yeah. And today, because they are being offered opportunities, and I must add to that that Haitians, when offered opportunities, they do succeed. I believe that there's going to be some movement. Please. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hausler with Build Change, a social enterprise that is working in Haiti to uh, train and empower people to rebuild and retrofit houses there. Um, I, we work, it, it, we hire Haitian engineers and then we partner with the private sector in order to supplement the engineering and management capacity that we need in order to deliver our programs. Um, but I'd like to ask a question about why there isn't more private sector involvement in some of the large-scale infrastructure projects that are going on. Recently, the World Bank uh, let out an RFP for a large infrastructure project, and I understand that the shortlisted organizations are all NGOs. And I'm wondering if there's some, what are the obstacles there, if it's a procurement, a procurement issue from the bank standpoint, or if it's a registration in Haiti standpoint, or what's, what's getting in the way, or if those NGOs actually have the private sector as their subs. That's great. <laughs> well, look, I, I can tell you from our own experience, uh, actually, there is a, a couple of large engineering companies that have done what I think is fundamental to be able to get contracts in the future, which is to bet on Haiti. And to bet on Haiti means not just to get one contract, fly by night, bring all your people, and goodbye. We look for companies that are going to settle themselves bring the equipment, leave it in Haiti, hire Haitian engineers, hire Haitian people, and they frankly are, have done a tremendous job. There's a Dominican company, there's a, a Brazilian company, there's, a, you know, companies, one of the fascinating things in Haiti is for a, for a country that was so fundamental in helping liberate and support, for instance, Simon Bolivar, in his, when he was broke, in his campaign to liberate the Andean countries, he went to Haiti. And he went to Haiti and got funding. He came uh, and, and left uh, uh, to, to do one of his most important campaigns. Well, today, many countries in Latin America never looked at Haiti. Today, that's very different. And a lot of companies and investors from Latin America are looking at this investor opportunity because what we see today increasingly, of course, is the, the nurturing of the South-South kind of uh, cooperation and development. I must add to that uh, that the bureaucracy in Haiti had been heavy in the past and that had discouraged uh, entrepreneurs. And we have uh, many laws that are in front of the parliament right now waiting to be uh, voted. For instance, it's only the other day that we voted the laws on building uh, condominiums in 2012, la copropriété, being able to buy an apartment, you know, and living uh, together. So we were slow at doing these things. And now with this new leadership, it's, it's very encouraging and people are looking more and more so that will help the private sector move. Mr. President, the hour has gone very quickly. Any, any last words? <clears throat> Well, again, I would like to thank everyone who is showing interest in Haiti. Uh, we have been hit by nature many times, but we are fighters. We will, we will come back, and especially with the kind of support that I feel from the World Economic Forum, from the partners that are here on the panel, and from the people who are sh actually showing interest in Haiti, I believe that better days are ahead of us. So thank you, and I welcome you to come and visit Haiti, see for yourself. And I want you to see in this new leadership a partner. As I have stated before, we will stand by you, protect your investment, 
and make sure that you can prosper and make money. When you do, you pay your taxes, you create jobs, and Haiti prospers. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And, and let, let me just close in thanking all the panelists. And actually, Luis, you made a really important point that Haiti, in fact, was the second republic in the Americas. In 1804, it was through their own determination, they won their freedom. So with a proud, proud past, and now with the potential of a hopeful future. And just like in 1804, the key secret today is going to be leadership. So thank you very much, Mr. President, for being part of this. Thank you.